Jeanette, I love the work that Jeanette is doing, you know, um, in her adopt salon groups and, um, and the adoptive parenting group. And um, actually, I know Jeanette from years ago when um, Stephanie Siegel did a, a, a kind of support group network of support groups that I think Jeanette is, is um, also doing, which is, you know, the adoptive parents and the kids and the different ages and that sort of thing. And um, what happens is that everyone feels like there's a place for them, you know, and it is real clear that it's, you know, the parents are getting something, the kids are getting something. And um, sometimes those kids, like, you know, really grow up through those groups. And, um, you know, the parents are kind of going, okay, they're 15, are we still going? <laughs> and um, and the kid goes well pff, yeah you know so it, it's really amazing how and especially for adoptees who don't really tell you things you know who aren't really maybe able to connect really well they might not be able to say gosh mom thanks so much for making me go because now when I go it's easy but when I start, first started it wasn't you know they're not going to have those words but as parents you know our job is to kind of help them to get more and more comfortable because those are the people they're gonna feel comfortable with. So always try to find um, groups of people that your adopted children look like, act like, and are like. You know, because all of us feel weird and different for whatever reason. So we need to have places where we feel like we fit in. So that's, you know, part of what you can do. And then if you're in a family where like, you know, oh, well, my sister has, you know, her birth mom and her brothers and no, 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 no. Um, sometimes what happens is those, that birth family does sort of take in the sibling that doesn't have the open adoption. You know, and sometimes it doesn't, and it, you know, it doesn't have to be that way, but, um, you know, sometimes it is. And then sometimes, you know what, you just can't give them what you think they want. And, um, You know, I don't know, and this goes back to sort of intuition. I, I want to say I don't know how bad that is. You know what I mean? And, and that is part of life. And yeah, yeah. Like, um, you know, like, like my sister never wanted to find her birth mom. You know, and I got to trust her intuition that, that probably she's not going to like what she finds. You know, and, um, but I always did. So I followed my intuition and, you know, it worked out okay. And, and what you do in, in reunions, whether things work out or not, you try to figure out how to make it work the best for you. So, um, so I do want to talk about like, what do you do when you're having difficulty, when you're like, uh, you're in a reunion and it's like, uh, uh, uh. Um, part of what I see happen a lot is in a reunion, and, and basically to me the reunion is the adoptee and the birth parent, that's sort of the primary reunion. Um, if those people aren't really talking to each other, or if one of those people is little, um, then the adoptive parent is in on that too. So, um, so it could be a lot of people, but it's basically about the adoptee and the birth parent. And um, like any relationship, one person might feel more gung-ho about it than the other. What I find happens is that the person who feels gung-ho about it, they're the ones that are like, you know, attacking the, the one who doesn't feel so gung-ho, and then they keep backing off, and this person keeps moving, sometimes you really have to just stop and notice what you're doing. You know, so if you're the person that's like, you know, walking, 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 you know, I just really need to talk to you, really need to talk to you, you know, and, you're, and the other person is kind of going, oh, um, just stop and notice what's happening. That's what, that's what mindfulness is about. You really have to notice what you're doing, and you really have to notice what the other person is doing. And um, a lot of times what I see in reunions is that the person that really, really wants, really, really wants, it's just kind of about fear, it's about pain, it's about, you know, I don't want to be rejected, um, I want to know that you love me, those kinds of things. Well, that other person is probably not going to be able to give that to you. And that's the part that you need to realize um, or help somebody realize, no matter where you are, you know, depending on where you are in that situation, um, somebody else can't make you feel good about yourself. You know, you have to feel good about yourself. So what a reunion can do, what a reunion relationship can do, is kind of give you a mirror about how you do relationships. You know, and to look at the other parts of the relationships. 
So um, if you find that you're the kind of person that like, you were always meant like your sister-in-law, was it? I mean, is she always like that controlling and that like pushy? I mean, I would guess probably. You know, I mean, she's the one that like is going to do it, you know? Um, so with someone like that, you have to say, look, thank you. I, I know you did it with the best of intention. Thank you so much. And then you do the parenting trick. The phrase of next time. <laughs> next time, I'd really like you to come to me first, and then I'll contact that person. You know, and, and you can say it really just as, as centered and as you know quiet as that. What happens is that people get kind of escalated, and ah, um, that doesn't work at all. You know, and again, the key is when in doubt, tell the truth. Use I statement. So when you use I statements, you own it, you're responsible for the feeling, and make sure you say a feeling with it because no one can debate your feelings. That's why I statements are so try. wonderful. Yeah, they can try. <laughs> they can try. Like, um, like say you're the one that's being pursued by the other person. And the other person is saying, you know, look, I call you all the time, I email you all the time, and you are just never, ever, ever responding to me. Don't you know how that makes me feel? <clears throat> and you can say, and, and take a deep breath first, because that kind of calms you. Go, and then use their name. Say, you know, Jocelyn, when you call me every day, and when you send me an email every day, I feel a little overwhelmed. I feel like it's too much. And I don't know if, if you feel like it's too much, but I really want to let you know that I feel like it's too much. I think what would really feel good to me is hearing from you once a week. Do you see how that's all I statements? And um, even the room got quiet. So um, it really can quiet the other person down. And sometimes what you can do is you can sort of just practice that, you know, with, with friends or people at home, just sort of practice that role playing. Um, but the I statements are just fabulous. It's sort of the core of therapy. You know, I'll save you like a few therapy sessions. <laughs> I statements. Go to the I statement. And, um, and if you go to the I statements with the feelings, no one can debate your feelings. If you, feel, if you say, you know, when you call me so much, um, I just feel a little scared. Well, you have no right to feel scared. You shouldn't feel scared. What is scary about me? Then you take that breath again, because it's coming at you. You go, I just feel like there's too much expected of me. I just feel like you want too much of me. And this is all I can do right now. And then add the piece that will be helpful. Say, I hope you can respect. So say your piece with the I statements, and at the end say, I hope you can respect that. And if they're able to, to hear you out, if they're able to not interrupt you, wow, you know, wow. So I don't know if you have anybody that's like that intense, that, that much, but, but typically, you know, like any relationship, there's a pursuer and there's a pursuit. Um, and so a lot of times in, uh, if you read posts and articles, about uh, adoption reunions, um, oh, there's a phrase that they use, and I don't really like it because it doesn't feel like it fits. Pullback, is that what they call it? You know, the adoptee pullback? To me, it's just like the adoptee breathing, you know, because um, sometimes, again, when, when somebody's at you too much, they're really trying to fulfill their own needs. Mm -hmm. That's the tricky part. And, um, and <laughs> the tricky part about it is that you can't tell them that, you know? so. When I say I statements, I don't mean, I feel like you're really just trying to fulfill your needs. That's not what you're supposed to say. You're supposed to say, you know, I feel like I just can't give you all that you're asking of me. So, so you do it sort of that way. Um, and one of the things that I do tell people is, is really negotiate, really talk about like what works for you. And um, what you'll find is that there's different levels of communication. Um, you know, eye to eye, face to face is the most intense. Um, some adoptees don't like that, it's just too much, that sort of thing. A lot of times what I'll tell adoptive parents is if you want to really connect with your adopted kid and they're kind of one of those people that like, you know, has a hard time connecting, um, go, go next to them and do something. Do what's called um, parallel play, 
you know, if you're a preschool teacher, you do parallel play. play. Um, two kids are playing together. They're not playing with each other, really, but, you know, at the same time. So parallel is really good. It's also why in a car mm -hmm. you can have a really good conversation, whether it's like with your, you know, um, friend or, or partner or kid. You know, it, it works because you're parallel. You're not eye to eye because that's like too intense sometimes.